when people talk about dialogue, the subject is always style. Do the characters speak realistically or do they use heightened language? Is it snappy? Is it literary? And though style is an important subject, there is one essential part of dialogue that should come first and yet it's mostly ignored. Content. Before a character can say something in a certain way, he needs to say something. And what I discovered about the types of content dialogue can have will change forever not only how you listen to dialogue in movies, TV shows, plays and books, but also how you listen to dialogue in real life. There are only two types of dialogue, be it in fiction or reality, and they are the practical and the analytical. The practical consists of facts. What happened in the past, what is happening in the present, what will happen in the future. Facts and events. Practical. John is a man of focus, commitment, sheer will. I once saw him kill three men in a bar with a bouncer. John will come for you. The analytical is what is inside your mind and not in the real world. It's an opinion, a feeling, a hypothesis and a conclusion. Analyses, analogies, metaphors and connections are all analytical. A relationship, I think, is, is like a shark, you know, it has to constantly move forward or it dies. And I think what we got on our hands <clears throat> is a dead shark. Every person has a preference for one or the other. Practically inclined people like to talk about their experiences. I went to that place, I did this and that. Oh, you did? My cousin went there too, but he did that and this. If you don't have a fact to follow up, you'll be silent in the conversation. The analytical lot can find them boring and unimaginative. As I'm writing this letter, I'm eating potato chips. I washed my socks and dried them on the TV. I should have brung the iron. You know this is pathetic, right? Analytically inclined people prefer to discuss world views, plans and meanings. I think this means that, but that would mean something else. I feel like this is a variation of that. You gotta have an opinion either for or against everything to keep up with such talks. Practical speakers often think they're useless and loony. Monsieur here is stuck right between Scylla and Charybdis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm afraid he's no Ulysses. <laughs> okay, what, what's happening here? Now, these two types are rarely absolutes. They are poles with a thousand variations in between. Many opinions are more factual than profound, and many facts are ultimately points of view in disguise. Predictions for the future often stand in the middle ground. A line that's 100% practical would be something like barely comprehensible jargon. Mr. Watson, steady on a reciprocal course. Maintain our present heading. All right, sir. Sonar, when we come about, standard sweeps on both our bows. Have T. Brudel, report to the XO and the CIC. Mr. Lopez, on bounce, local control, fire when they bear. Distant contact bearing 160. Sonar reports distant contact bearing 160. Dickey, Greyhound, the contact is now 10 degrees to my port. While a line that's 100% analytical is akin to a theoretical abstract philosophy. But murder is immoral. Immorality is subjective. Yes, but subjectivity is objective. Not in any rational scheme of perception. Perception is irrational and implies imminence. When you meet a neighbor in the elevator, neither of you wants to discuss your views on existence preceding essence or vice versa so soon in the relationship. So you both withdraw to practical commonalities like the weather. Hello. How are you? How's the folks? What's new? I'm great. That's good. Ha <laughs> ha, knock wood. As tedious as it is, most conversations you'll find in your life will be practical. Well, well, that's life. What do you know? How's the wife? Gotta fly. Oh my. Ta-ta. Olive oil. Goodbye. And the analytical part will limit itself to superficial opinions. The fuck? <laughs> yeah, me. You really fuck. In movies too. Characters speak about the plot. So-so scripts have characters say whatever is useful to get the story going and provide nothing deep about themselves. Screenwriters today often confuse backstory with personality. So they have characters talk about their past thinking they're fleshing out a human, when all they're doing is spew practicalities from another time frame. Remember Game of Thrones, that show they cancelled so soon on season 6? Dialogue scenes, which were the bigger chunk of the series, consisted of three potential subjects. Things that happened in the past, things that are happening in the present and things that will happen in the future. 
Someday, if you decide not to execute me, I'll tell you all about why I killed my father. So, here we sit. I lost my father, my uncle, and two brothers fighting the damn crows. I'm not asking you to forget your dead. I'll never forget mine. Our walls have been fully repaired. The gates have been reinforced. We have enough food for six months. We are more prepared for a siege than they could ever be. I kid you not, these are all random scenes from a single randomly selected episode. The problem with overly practical dialogue is this. On the top level, we open up his relationship with his father. And say, I will not follow in my father's footsteps. Then the next level down, we feed him. Slightest disturbance. Sedation. For sleep. Sable enough to create three Whenever I hear things away. like this for Snatch too long, Are we gonna feel my brain goes blank and files everything away under plot stuff. The pilot's up top, the first class cabin on the nose, so no one would walk through. If I just wanted plot for plot's sake, I could just read the Wikipedia summary and save a buck in two hours. What we want is characters, and characters mostly reveal themselves through analytical dialogue. Yes, there's action, but most of the runtime in most movies is dialogue. If you look up which films are considered to have the best dialogue, you'll see a pattern. All of them are mostly analytical. You're good, you're very good. Their dialogue works the same way a great conversation in real life works. Boy, I got vision and the rest of the world wears bifocals. Something practical is mentioned. Move the money from your client's pocket into your pocket. Then characters give their opinions and points of view about the subject. But if you can make a client's money at the same time, it's advantageous to everyone, correct? <laughs> no. Delving into the analytical. Nobody knows if the stock is gonna go up, down, sideways, or in fucking circles. Least of all stockbrokers. In Pulp Fiction, Jules tells Vincent a story he believes to be true. Gave her a foot massage. Practical. Then what did Marcellus do? Sent a couple of cats over to his place. They took him out on his patio, threw his ass over the balcony. Vincent gives his opinion. Yeah, so I probably didn't expect myself to react the way he did, but he had to expect a reaction. And they enter a discussion about the meaning of foot massages. Whoa, 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 stop right there. I'm giving a bitch a foot massage ain't even the same thing. It's not, it's the same ballpark. Ain't no ballpark, neither. Analytical. And look, I've given a million ladies a million foot massages, and they all meant something. We act like they don't, but they do. I mean, that's what's so cool about it. Through their points of view, we get to know their personalities and soon enough they feel like more than characters. They feel like friends we know quite well. Because those are the people we talk to analytically the most. Our friends. Practical dialogue should serve for two things. Exposition and as a springboard that leads to the analytical. Have you ever given a foot massage? I'm the foot master. You've given a lot of them? Yeah. Would you give a guy a foot massage? Here's something that happened, now here's what I think about that thing. I can't swim! Why are you crazy? The fall will probably kill you. In All About Eve, Eve tells everyone about her past. <laughs> Practical. <laughs> then Birdie makes her opinion known. What a story. Everything but the bloodhound snapping at her rear end. Analytical. And it leads Margot to give her opinion about Birdie's opinion. There are some human experiences, Birdie, that do not take place in a vaudeville house. And that even a fifth-rate vaudevillian should understand and respect. Usually, the best and most intelligent examples of dialogue are opinions stacking up on each other. Opinions of opinions. A cascade of the analytical. My father is no different than any other powerful man, like a senator or a president. You know how naive you sound. Senators and presidents don't have men killed. Who's being naive, Kay? The two types of dialogue can also be used to differentiate characters. If you want to make a character sound boring and likely stupid, all you gotta do is make them overly practical and speak extensively about something useless. Does anyone have any change? Shrimp is the fruit of the sea. You can barbecue it. Boil it, brawl it, bake it, saute it. There's um, shrimp kebabs, shrimp creole. Who do I give the sovereign to? You turn right by Eton College Chapel and then left just before you get to the lower chapel. Then you go three or four miles across Dorney Common. A shilling for the driver, of course. It's pineapple shrimp, 
lemon shrimp, coconut shrimp, pepper shrimp, shrimp soup, shrimp stew, shrimp salad. Does anyone have change for half a crown? What people don't understand is that there are hundreds of types of herring, each with its own interesting history. The opposite of seduction is being overly practical. Oh, cooking, you, what is that, chili? Yeah. Cool. You make enough for everybody? <laughs> yeah, you want some? Oh, uh, no, it makes me, it makes me fart. <laughs> the gas is odorless, but they add the smell so you know when there's a leak. I noticed you were wearing a hat, and that's, that, that's pretty cool. Like, I don't see a lot of, like, girls wearing hats, you know? And I'm wearing a hat, too, you know? It's like, it's like, we're, it's like we're hat twins. <laughs> A lot of other gas smells. I mean, I am a twin. Like, I'm part. I'm one part of a twin. I, I have a twin sister, is what I'm trying to say. Hmm. Yeah, she farts a shit ton, man. The lowest type of analytical dialogue is the one that sounds practical. If I were, for instance, a suit of clothes, you wouldn't call me a stylish cut, and I prefer it that way. But I can safely say I'm made of solid material. It can be used to make a character try to sound smarter than he is. Sometimes you remind me of a house. And I give protection in the winter. Need I say more? No, Albert. You've given a complete and accurate description of yourself. But at worst, it can just be the writer trying to sound smarter than he is. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. Not like here. When talking to practical people, an analytical mind is often treated as a sign of status and intelligence. Let me handle this. These are my people. They're gay? No, you bleeding imbecile. They have style. They're cultured. They're sophisticated. So they're gay. In Margin Call, Jeremy Iron, CEO, hears a bunch of practicalities. Packaging new MBS products that combine several different tranches of rating classification in one tradable security. Then he translates them into the analytical. The music is about to stop, and we're gonna be left holding the biggest bag of odorous excrement ever assembled in the history of capitalism. After all, someone who ponders before doing something is normally smarter than someone who just does something. But overanalyzing is the mark of the pedantic tool. Will France make it? Birth rate, youth unemployment, sclerotic state, um, angry Arabs, all that. Right. Will they make it or will they pull a grease? It's like Samuel Beckett. You know, I admire the technique, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hit me on a gut level. And this fake mask of intellect doesn't fool anyone. It's got a... Uh, Quiet intensity. Well, no, I... I well, then uh, a certain noisy, relaxed quality, maybe. No, what I meant was... How about a quietly noisy, relaxed intensity? Still, no rule is set in stone. The strong, silent type is intelligent and practical. Jean-Pierre Melville built a whole career on practical men who only speak what they need to and nothing more. They may be sphinxes to the audience, but goddammit, they get the job done! His compatriot Eric Homer, on the other hand, made his name with characters who speak almost exclusively analytically. Je me confie pas beaucoup avec toi alors que discours n'en plus finir avec des gens que je connais à peine qui ne sont rien pour moi, qui ne sont que des relations passagères. Oui, peut-être pour ce que j'appellerais les extras de la vie, la part à moitié rêvée, à moitié agie, mais pour la part solide, je ne dis pas forcément la part profonde, les deux le sont. J'ai horreur de l'ambiguïté. Mais tu vois, si elle est fondamentalement attirée par des gens qui sont le contraire exact de moi, si elle n'est pas cette fille que je croyais faite pour moi, comme je me crois fait pour elle, et si cette conviction sur laquelle repose tout mon amour est détruite, alors je l'aime plus. These are three different movies. To conclude, the practical and the analytical are ideal tools to differentiate characters. It's a contrast of personalities made simple. Kind of feels like it's getting a little stuffy in here. Like one of those days you want to have class outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What are you two talking about? We are outside. But if you are looking for a masterpiece of dialogue, then you are looking for a good example of the analytical. Because that's the dialogue that bears a character open and reveals their innermost individuality. They don't just talk about things, they think about things. And that gives them complexity. After all, dialogue is only as good as the characters who speak it. Yeah, well... You know, that's just like, uh, 
your opinion, man.